I used to work for the morgue at the local hospital. The morgue, where we stored the decedents, was attached to a small funeral parlor, and there was a large church on the other side of it, far removed from the hospital, but still attached via tunnels. Most of the decedents would make the trip down those tunnels and into the funeral parlor after a short stay in the morgue and then the prep room. I thought it was a strange setup, but it had been that way since I could remember. I guess it was efficient, I suppose. Very few bodies had to be transported to the other locations. We just tagged and logged them as they entered the morgue, autopsied them. Then, when we got the green light, we wheeled them down a corridor to the prep area, where I spent most of my working hours, and I embalmed them. And that's where they were made ready for their wakes, or for the cremation chamber. Once they were presentable, we wheeled them through a long tunnel and into the basement of the funeral home. My boss's wife was the funeral director there. Her brother was the preacher who presided over the parishioners at the church on the other side of the funeral parlor. When the shadow figure in the recessed corner of my midnight room growled, low and gravelly, I stopped my little happy bop walk, knowing that my day's work was now nowhere near over, and that it was very possible that I wouldn't just be going home late, but not at all. Terror stopped my heart, sent electric shockwaves through my entire being from the center of my chest where the reverberating sound hit. I had screwed up royally, and it was too late to do anything about it. You see, the old proverbial shit was about to hit the fan, splattering my little spot in the universe in a most unsettling and nasty way. The shadow on the wall writhed like a newborn pup trying to free itself from the birth sack, and only the muscles I could use were the ones that moved my eyes. Hell, I might have well been a severed head for all the good I was from the nose down. The rest of my body was rigid, and I thought I must look like some of the corpses I work on after rigor mortis set in. Eyes wide, mouth gaped, body unmoving as cement. While my brain screamed commands to my frozen body, my eyes watched the shadow unfold as it turned toward me, my ears barely hearing the low growl, and my body feeling it. It wouldn't be long before I saw more than the thing's shadow. If I couldn't persuade my body into some kind of movement, One of the five corpses in the adjacent room was likely to make a meal out of me. Oh, I hope it's not the floater. I hope it's not the floater. Please don't be that guy. My brain was no longer shouting out commands. Instead, it was looping that one plea and all the images it conjured like a horror flick. The cops found the floater in an advanced state of decay and brought him in with the others earlier in the week. It seemed that people died in groups nowadays. Hardly ever did a day pass that we had less than three bodies come in. That day had been a slow day. The floater was, by far, the worst looking and the worst smelling body in that day's train of corpses. If I'd had a choice of which one would react to the new embalming fluid, the safer, non-formaldehyde-based embalming fluid, and come lumbering after me, it would have been Mrs. Nelson, the tiny 77-year-old widow who had no family. If she had to be mangled, I wouldn't catch hell for it because she was a state burial, which meant she was scheduled for a closed casket funeral over an open grave, and I would have a better chance of surviving an attack by her. The shadow was much too large to be the representative of such a frail body. It was more likely that the younger, stronger candidate had awakened, revived by the muck that replaced his blood. That was a problem for me. I was alone for the first time in several months because my partner, Stephen, had gone home early complaining with flu-like symptoms. The new 
Ardbalm fluid was supposed to do away with the nasal and eye irritation, bronchial aggravation, headaches, and even depression for us morticians. At least, that's what the representative at the state meeting told Curry, my boss. And there was no need for the expensive extraction system that sucked the fumes out of our room anymore. Either because Artabom was friendly to work with no matter how long we were in contact with. Only thing is that sometimes corpses, like my floater, got a jolt of RD bomb and decided they weren't too dead after all. Kind of puts nasal irritation and headaches into perspective. Personally, I've never seen a reanimation, but I'd heard all the juicy, sickening rumors of this horror from the other morgues across the state. The old trope about the flesh and brain consuming zombies topped the list at the rumor mill, and was followed closely by the crazed animal-like zombies that just thrashed the hell out of whoever or whatever they laid a hold of. Things that you only half listen to like a little kid half believing in the boogeyman that hides in the closet under the bed. The growling stopped, and silence so loud it hurt my ears descended on my office. Still frozen in place, I listened to the thundering of the wall clock second hand, ticking off the remainder of my life, or sanity, whichever came to an end first. Then, the slippery slap, slap sound of half-rotting feet hitting the tile kicked my laden body into flight. The exit door seemed a mile away. It was also locked thanks to Stephen and his safety first attitude. Couldn't have someone sneaking in on me while I was in the prep room. The lock finally disengaged under the tutelage of my quaking. Sweaty fingers, but the bubbly, gargling voice of my floater stopped me from turning the knob. All the strength tends to fall out of us non-hero types in moments of severe nightmarish terror. I could tell you it was the thoughts of my fellow humans and their safety that stilled my hand on the knob, but that would be a lie. It was his voice that knocked all the fire out of me. What did you do to me? I didn't turn around, didn't want to see how he was talking. I'd sewn his mouth shut hours before. Besides, how was I supposed to answer that question? What I had done to him was simply sew his eyes and lips together, suction some of the river water from his lungs and other bodily ponds, and pump a few quarts of dyed arterial fluid into him, to not make him look undead, but to preserve him until his burial. His feet slapped the tiles as he moved across the room. I huddled with my face to the cold steel of the thick door wishing that Stephen or Curry would come dashing in to save me at the last minute, knowing that wouldn't happen. No knight in shining armor for Sammy Hinckley, no. Just me in a walking, burbling corpse. Sounding as if he were speaking underwater, he asked, Am I in a hospital? What's wrong with me, doctor? Yes, the morgue and funeral home were attached to a hospital. Now, there was something I could answer without restrictions. And since this thing obviously had retained some modicum of intelligence, maybe I could reason with it. Still, without turning, I said, Yes, this is the hospital. Ah, uh, well, you had an accident at the river. I can't feel anything. I'm all numb and it's hard to breathe, Doc. No shit, Sherlock, I thought. But aloud, I said, You need the doctor, I'm not him. I'll get him, but you have to stay here, or right there. I immediately tried the knob again. You're not the doc? Um, no, I'm just the night nurse. I turned the knob. Wait, I can't see too good. Could you help me? It was pleading in his voice. He sounded as if he were in a lot of pain, and I tried to tell myself that it didn't work that way. 
If he had reanimated, he couldn't feel anything. Um, no, just wait where you are. I yanked the door open and spun into the hall, grabbing the knob from the other side of the door and pulling at the same time, trying to shut it before I saw Freddy Floater's grey, sagging, torn face. The pneumatic hinge hissed and resisted, and I did see, just for an instant. What I saw was worse than any zombie movie icon, worse than the most mutilated and decayed corpse I'd ever worked with. What I saw was an empty morgue office, washed in sterile fluorescent light. The hinge finally gave and the door shut. And not let go of the knob, but was stunned and stood still for fear that Freddy might be on the other side of the door, hidden. I mean, why else had I not seen him in the office? I'd always heard that the dead travel fast, but the undead shamble at best. Could Freddy have moved quickly enough to get behind the door before it shut? My sanity was in question, and I was no longer sure I had seen the shadow unfold in the prep room. Maybe this was an all-late-night delusion. The fumes might just be harmful enough to cause hallucinations. There's no reanimated floater to my office, and I'm standing here in the hallway trying to lock a figment of my imagination in my office. At least, I hope that's what had happened. Very slowly, I relaxed my hand from off the knob and tried to slow my breathing. But seconds turned into minutes. It felt like hours as I strained my ears, listening for the tiniest sound from inside my office. But there was nothing. Using my key, I locked the metal door, just in case and I walked down the dimly lit corridor toward the elevator that would take me up and into the main part of the hospital where there are many other people. Living, breathing people. Curry would be around somewhere, most likely in the lounge on the third floor where he was trying to court one of the psych ward night nurses. Leaving the subterranean workspace had never felt so good. On the ride up, I kept trying to figure out how to best broach the subject of reanimation with Curry. He was prone to outbursts of undiluted rage that he always directed at the nearest person when situations of any kind arose. He liked a nice, neat, orderly morgue, and anything else would raise his hackles. With Stephen gone home... I would have to bear the brunt of the outburst alone. The silly thought of not reporting the incident did cross my mind. I could always say everything was fine when I left the morgue and that the reanimation happened sometime after I went home. Of course, that would be unethical. Unethical and, well, pretty dangerous. I could never forgive myself if Stephen or Curry walked into my office unsuspecting and got hurt because I failed to report a reanimation. The elevator doors slip open on the third floor, and Curry stepped inside, red-faced and glaring. He was already pissed off, and no way was I going to add Freddy Floater to the mix, not unless I had to. He hit the button for the lobby. As the elevator trundled downward again, he ranted and raved about the nurse who rejected him, and even laughed at him as she pointed out his wedding ring. I told him to try to have a good night when he exited, and I hit the button to return to the morgue level. I would just have to figure this out on my own. As I unlocked the door to my office, I prayed that it had been all a hallucination. The only way to unanimate a reanimated corpse is to cut off its head. And Freddy, well... He was huge compared to me. Besides, I'm not really the cutting off people's heads with a sword ninja type. I'm a scrawny nerd working with corpses for a living. And if it came right down to it, I just don't think I could chop off someone's head. It wouldn't matter if they were alive or reanimated from my prep table. You see, I'm just not that guy. 
There was no Freddy floater in my office. No sign of some zombie shambling through and making a mess of my stuff. There was absolutely nothing, actually. I stepped inside and let the door's pneumatic hinge hiss closed slowly. The sound of crunching and then terrible slurping, ripping meat sound came from the prep room. My guts tightened and my thoughts went fuzzy. And all I could think of was poor Miss Nelson. It's a good thing she was a state burial, because there would be no fixing what Freddy Floater had done to her. He was chewing on her leg like a fat man eating fried chicken. I gasped and his head swiveled toward me. He growled low. He had torn all the stitches loose from his mouth, and the black threads poked outward from his grime-covered lips. His eyes were still sewn shut. Thank God for the small favors, huh? He let her leg flop back to the table and turned in my direction. Doc, you gonna help me now? He held out his arms in supplication. I had to find the blade and cut off his head, and I dashed to the other side of the room and opened the cabinet where I store my tools. I grabbed the list of the knife, and before I could lose my nerve, I swung at the back of his neck. The blade opened a wide trench, severing tendons, tissue, and muscle. Freddy let out a loud moan and reached for the wound even as his head lulled gruesomely. He begged me not to hurt him anymore and fell to the floor moaning. His huge, partially decayed body hitched with sobs that produced no tears. There was no blood, of course. I had replaced that with our super-safe, non-toxic, and environmentally friendly arterial fluid. A few drops of that hit the tile floor, but with no pulse, a few drops were all that came out. Now, I don't know how you would have handled that situation, but I couldn't do anything but feel sorry for the thing I'd so grievously injured. It wasn't his fault he had reanimated. So I couldn't finish him off. Instead, I calmed him, coaxed him back onto the prep table, and told him he wasn't in any danger. I told him he would have to be strong so I could get the stitches out of his eyelids. He was... well... He whimpered, but that was all. When he opened his eyes, they were the same flat, lifeless, gray-white they'd been when he came in. When he'd been dead for real. I told him what had happened to him. He didn't want to believe me, but his decaying body convinced him. And he tried to cry again. Freddy was my first basement stowaway. I finished out my shift by getting all Freddy Floater's paperwork in order, making all the required audio files as he sat quietly in my office. God, I'll never sit in that chair again. I mean, the poor guy was literally falling apart. Pieces of him clung to that vinyl chair when he stood up. So I sneaked him out to my car through a side door, and then went back to do a final walkthrough. I left Miss Nelson as she was, and then I exited using my usual route. I put Freddy in my basement and explained to him that if he didn't stay there, out of sight, someone would make him dead again. I mean, he had the mental capacity of a young child, but he understood enough that he agreed. Convincing Curry that everything had been normal when I'd left work was easy. He was still preoccupied about his failed attempt at an affair. Stephen, though, wasn't as easily convinced. He had many questions, and the first couple of hours we were working together, I answered them. And then, he started having me repeat every detail again and again. And finally, I told him to drop it, and told him no more. At the end of that shift, I took a neck brace from one of the storage rooms, Freddy needed some help keeping his head straight after I'd cut through the tendons at the back of his neck. I felt so bad about it, but at the same time, I knew there was no fixing it. So, well, a few months later, it had happened again. A woman. I smuggled her out and put her in my basement, hoping she and Freddy would get along. 
Well, they did. As long as I kept bringing them food, food for them was flesh, it didn't matter what kind, they just gobbled it up. I didn't think I'd be able to continue stealing amputated body parts from the hospital, but I was able to. When the dead were slated for cremation by the state, I would often take off limbs to feed the undead in my basement. And Steve, whom I liked very much, kept nosing around in my business, until one evening he caught me stuffing an amputated leg into the trunk of my car on lunch break. And well, you can guess all the questions he had for me then. And instead of trying to explain everything, I told him to come to my house the next day, and I would show him. I told him he wouldn't believe me unless he saw for himself. I liked Steve, but my undead friends liked him more. They made me proud the way they shared him, but they also scared me with their ferocious attack on him. It made me realize that they could turn on me. Still, I couldn't bring myself to kill them. They had become like children to me, as sick as that sounds. Within two days, I noticed a serious change in their behavior. They had taken to climbing the stairs and clawing at the door to my kitchen. They fought with each other too. Terrible, vicious fights. The fresh meat and blood had changed them, and I no longer loved them like children but began to see them as the abominations they truly were. It was the week after they tore into Steve that I decided that I had to do something. I couldn't enlist outside help. I'd be blamed for Steve's death and for the stealing corpses. Even though they were reanimated, the state still viewed them as corpses. Add to that the charges that could be leveled against me for stealing body parts to feed the two undead, and I could go to prison for life. I used the chainsaw and cut through the wooden steps that lead to the basement. Only the top three remained intact. At least I don't have to worry that Freddy and Friend will come barging through the door and feast on me someday. They cowered in the farthest corner, frightened of the noise as I sawed, their gray, lifeless eyes wide. But as soon as I was finished, Freddy shambled to the destroyed stairs growling and clawing up at me as I stood inside the kitchen, leaning so I could see down there. And soon, they were both growling and gnashing their teeth as they tried in vain to reach me. With the steps destroyed, the only way down there is with a ladder, and I should have manned up and cut off their heads when I had the chance, back at the morgue, but I was too much of a wimp. And now, I'm terrified of them. They've had a taste of fresh meat, and it changed them. They're not the scared, mewling, pitiful things they were when I brought them here. No way I'm going to descend a ladder to get in there with them. I stopped feeding them two weeks ago, and I still hear them fighting sometimes. I don't know. Can you starve the undead? Well, I certainly hope so.